Guten Tag! Bonjour! Happy Spring! Another reading of On His Majesty's Secret Service. Jane is still with the handsome devils, having cocktails, eating dinner. But will she escape? There was a similar pause in the chatter at the other tables. Coney made conversation about the decor of the room, and this gave her a chance to have a good look at the waiters. There were twelve of them in sight. It was not difficult to sum them up as three Corsicans, three Germans, three vaguely Balkan faces, Turks, Bulgars, Yugoslavs, and three obvious Slavs. There would probably be three Frenchmen in the kitchen. Was this the old pattern of sector, the well-tried post-communist cell pattern of three men from each of the great gangster and secret service organizations in Europe? Were the three Slavs ex smirch men? The whole lot of them looked tough enough and had that quiet smell of the pro. The man at the airport was one of them. Coney recognized others as the reception steward and the man who had come to a room about the table. She heard the boys calling them Fritz, Yosef, Ivan, Ahmed, and some of them were ski guides during the day. Well, it was a nice little setup if Coney was right. They had to do something for recreation. They just couldn't sit propped in front of computers all day and night. Several of the men made advances at her through dinner, especially Belial, the American. What are they doing, she asks, as she turns toward Mr. Wood. In the intelligence center, I mean. Mr. Wood straightened his shoulders and said, These are the finest programmers in the world. Two from each continent for a total of thirteen. I will tell you later of fourteen. They have all been hand-selected. Microsoft, she asked. Better. Way ahead of anything anyone else is doing. All through dinner, he continued to brag about his software, plans, programmers, and genius. Coney excused herself after dinner, but Mr. Wood insisted that Fräulein Gitania escorted her to her room. At ten o'clock, she heard the good nights of the boys down the corridor and the click of the door shutting. She undressed, turned the thermostat on the wall down from 85 to 60, switched off the light, and lay on her back for a while, staring up in the darkness. Then she gave an authentic sigh of exhaustion for the microphones, if any, that were listening, and turned over on her side. Not long after... As she was dressed for bed, she stood in front of the mirror and spoke. Did you get all that? Back in London, Q and N were sitting together in the war room. As Q replied, Got it. Thanks, 008. That worked like a charm. Then Connie smiled. N was watching the video and listening with Q. I programmed that retainer, says Q, in her matronly voice. When my shed had more one, I thought it should be more practical than just fixing his teeth. So I designed that one f the double A is wearing now. Well done, Q, says N, in his fatherly manner. Now, Jane, you're supposed to be resting, on vacation, even grieving, scolded N. Now, stop working and go to bed. There was a knock on the door. Who's that? asked N. That is where my transmission ends, Jane smiled, removing a retainer, and the screen back in London went dark. She answered the door and found Belial there. Forgive me, he stuttered, but I was wondering if you would like to join me for one more drink. I'd love to, she rejoined, and frowned. But I was lately widowed, and it's just too soon for that sort of thing. I understand, he replied dejectedly. She closed the door and went back to brushing her hair and readying for bed. Another knock came at the door. She opened it resolutely, expecting Belial, when it turned out to be Rusalka. This is going to be a long night, she laughed to herself, after turning Rusalka away, even more reluctantly, and going back to bed. The next morning after breakfast, Ivana took her in the private gondola ski lift, along with her hand-gliding equipment, albeit broken down neatly, back down the mountain to the resort. Chapter 8. Passing the Shoe The next day, Jane engaged one of her favorite vices, gambling. She longed to hold the shoe and not have to pass it this time. Jane Brand idled through the pretty approaches to the casino, though this wasn't Royale in France. It was still quite beautiful here in Switzerland. There were young beaches and the heavy-scented pines. She was looking forward to the evening, remembering her other annual pilgrimages to Casino Royale, particularly the great battle across the bay she had with Lay Chief something or other so many years ago. She'd come a long way since then, dodged many bullets and much death, and loved many men, but there had been a drama and a poignancy about the particular adventure that every year drew her back to Royale and its casino, and to the small granite cross in the little churchyard that simply said, V.L. Rest in peace. And now that this new place was holding for her a beautiful September evening, a big win perhaps, a painful loss, a beautiful man like Mr. Pippernickel, but no, it was too soon for another man, such a short time after losing her husband, Thomas Ashworth. To think first of the game. This was the weekend of the Clouture Annuel back in Royale. Tonight, this was very Saturday night, the Casino Royale was holding its last night of the season. 
It was always a big event, and there would be pilgrims even from Belgium and Holland, as well as the rich regulars from Paris and Lille. In addition, the Syndicat Initiative et des Bains des Mers de Royale traditionally threw open its doors to all the local contractors and suppliers, and there were free champagne and a great groaning buffet to reward the town people for their work during the season. It was a tremendous carouse that rarely finished before breakfast time. The tables would be packed, and there would be a very high game indeed. Tonight, Brand had one million Swiss francs of private capital. Old francs, of course. About 700 euros worth. She always reckoned her private funds in old francs. It made her feel so rich. On the other hand, she made out her official expenses in new euros because that made them look smaller, but probably not to the chief accountant at headquarters. One million euros? For that evening, she was a millionaire. Might she so remain by tomorrow morning? And now she was coming into the promenade des Suisse, and there is the empire frontage of the Hotel Maison Rouge at Strasbourg and the Grand Caisson Bairn, and there, by God, on the gravel sweep alongside the steps, stood the little white Lancia, and at this moment a baguiste, in a striped waistcoat and green apron, was carrying two Vuitton suitcases up the steps to the entrance. So, Jane Brand slid her rental car and Alfa Romeo into the million-pound line of cars in the car park, told the same baguiste, who was now taking rich, small stuff out of the Lancia, to bring up her bags, and went into the reception desk. It was the young woman from the beach in Burkan, Morocco.